be able to present um, out here from Wadataka Paiute land because um, we are randomly getting dumped on with snow today and the passes would have been uh, pretty, pretty fun to drive through. Um, quick caveat before I start my presentation, um, because it has snowed so much today, I can see the snow inching its way off of our eaves. And it is very possible that while I am presenting, there will be um, a very loud sound of all of the snow actually coming off of the house. So I just want to add that caveat so that if people hear it, they're not um, you know, concerned about whatever that loud noise might have been. Um, so today I'm talking about drought in the Pacific Flyway. Um, I have been out in the Harney Basin for just under five years now. And in my time out here, I've seen some pretty big changes in um, water extent and timing. And um, it's all part of a larger trend that we're gonna cover um, in the next 45 minutes-ish. Oh, my presentation is not advancing, there we go. Okay, um, I'm actually gonna turn my video off too because my internet maybe is being slow. Um, all right, so a little bit about where we're going in this conversation. So the, the high altitude bit of the conversation, we're gonna talk about the Pacific Flyway and the Intermountain West. What are they? Um, what is their geographic extent? We're gonna talk about uh, the dynamism of these systems, both intra-annually, so within a year and inter-annually between years. Our mid-altitude conversation is going to be pretty specifically about drought. There's some important uh, terminology and um, understandings around drought that I think people need in order to understand the larger conversation about birds and drought. And then we're going to talk about, you know, the on-the-ground part of the conversation is going to be about Mountain National Wildlife Refuge and the Harney Basin, and then about three different species of birds that are uh, pretty intrinsically tied to wetlands and how drought is potentially or likely affecting them. We'll go a little bit into what all of this means and then um, you know, to try to end this on a more positive note, give some um, options for how you can get involved in supporting birds. All right, so our high altitude conversation, we're starting from the top of the Steens or near the top of the Steens at uh, Tiger Gorge and Tiger Notch. <laughs> so the geographic context of um, the Pacific Flyway and Intermountain West, we're gonna start with the Pacific Flyway because it's the larger concept. So the flyway is, so flyways in general are, I think of them as um, like, airline flight paths. So these are the flight paths that birds take when they're on their trips from the south to northern breeding grounds and from the north to their southern wintering grounds. The Pacific Flyway is approximately the area, the landmass west of the Rockies over to the Pacific Ocean. And then within that, we have the Intermountain West, which is basically the landmass between our um, like the Cascades, Sierra Nevada Range, and the Rockies. So it's it's all of the semi-low-lying land that exists between these pretty large mountain ranges. Um, within the Intermountain West, we, especially for a lot of our migratory and breeding birds, spend a lot of time talking about closed lake basins. So these are basins that have no apparent outlet. Uh, all of the water that is moving from rivers or creeks, um, springs, et cetera, is ending within that basin. So it's not, sometimes it can be large, like the Harney Basin. It can be smaller, kind of like the Shuakan River and Lake Ebert. Um, it's basically just that low-lying area that water um, travels to and then hangs out at until it's lost through evaporation. So closed lake basins in general don't lose water to percolation into the groundwater. They lose it just through um, warm temperatures and wind evaporating it up out of these uh, large lakes. They're often saline. And the, re the reason for that is that as water is evaporating, 
out of these lakes, all of the alkali salts and minerals and whatnot that the water was carrying with it get left behind. And historically, um, those lakes didn't dry up and so wind couldn't move the sediment out. Today what we're seeing is um, that a, a little bit some of the areas like the Harney Lake Playa when the wind comes in it's actually removing a lot of those salts and so in theory over time if that playa were to reflood it would potentially be less saline than it was um, before this drying out period. The closed lake basins the lakes that are in them can be permanent um, more like uh, we think of Lake Tahoe, um, in theory, Pyramid Lake, Great Salt Lakes, Malheur Lake, Goose Lake. Um, and they can be playas like Lake Ebert, which is historically a permanent lake that has a pretty extensive playa, kind of like Herney Lake. And they can be ephemeral. So there are actually lakes that exist in these closed lake basins that are only wet in really high water years. Um, and so they wouldn't be represented within this picture, but there are lakes like Black Rock Desert is, well, it's a playa, but it also has a pretty ephemeral lake that only exists in pretty high water years. So the Great Basin is this sub area within the Intermountain West. And really specifically, that's where a lot of the conversations that I participate in around birds and drought take place is within this larger Great Basin um, context. So one of the really important things that is sometimes hard for people to, to navigate is that these systems are really dynamic and, and that is a historic trend. So within, within a year, these systems, uh, particularly in the spring, as, as water runs off the mountains into the, the, into the bottoms of the basins, large areas of wetland are created and then as typically no more water is added to the system for the year, the extent of those wetlands tends to shrink um, naturally over time. And so this is all, all three of these pictures are from the same year. So um, 20, I think they're from 2019. Um, and you can see up here, where's my cursor? Near Burns, there's a bunch of blue. Those are all the flood irrigated wet meadows. By July, typically the water has been turned off and most uh, private land managers have also done a cutting of hay, which is why you see no more wetlands um, up in that Sylvia's floodplain burns area. And then by October, you can see that naturally Malheur Lake actually um, goes from being a pretty large lake to a much, to a still large, but much less large lake. And that's a, a really natural uh, pattern throughout the basin. And this slide looks a little bit overwhelming, but I'm going to try to make it less overwhelming. So it's an example of why these systems are so dynamic. So one factor that I think most people get kind of caught up on when thinking about um, systems like Malheur Lake and its watershed is precipitation. So in theory, in a high precipitation year, what a lot of people expect is that the lake will grow or at least remain stable. And that's true under the right temperature regime. So in cool temperatures with high precipitation, the lake is likely to grow. In high precipitation years with higher than average temperatures, the lake is likely to remain stable. The caveat to that is when we add the wind. So the last couple of years have been a great example of how the wind can drive evaporation um, in closed lake basin systems. So Malheur Lake in any given year is going to evaporate with warmer temperatures and wind, but we've had abnormally high wind speeds and durations of wind out here in the Harney Basin. And so in 2021, the high temperatures when that heat dome happened across the Pacific Northwest, we didn't experience the same peak in high temperatures. Instead, we experienced a really prolonged period of time where the temperatures were higher than average. And we added wind to that and you could actually watch Malheur Lake shrink because the, the wind as it moved across the lake, which is only about 
I think on average, it's about, well, in 2021, the average was about five or six inches deep. Currently, the average is about three inches deep. Um, and so the it doesn't take a lot of effort for the wind and the high temperatures to just um, move all that water up into the atmosphere out of the lake. In low precipitation years, with cool temperatures, you could expect that the lake would remain stable. In warm year, in low precipitation and warm temperature years, you expect the lake to shrink. And then, as I mentioned, in 2021, uh, with the wind and warm temperatures, we also had a really low, we were well below average on our snowpack that year. And so that combination um, contributed to the shrinking of Malheur Lake and the drying up of, um, for example, Marshall Pond, which is a pond at refuge headquarters. So one of the ways that we know that these systems have always been really dynamic is through the ecological dynamism that we see out here. So ecologically, we have species that are adapted to dynamic systems. And a really great example of these species are colonial nesting water birds. So in this picture, we've got mostly Franklin skulls, this one lone white-faced ibis. And so colonial nesting water birds are really any bird that gathers in large groups during the nesting season. All or most of their food is foraged in water, like a lake or in wetland ecosystems. And often these are in mixed flocks. And we'll see them in mixed flocks in the spring when they arrive uh, during migration as well. So um, when they very first arrive, it's not uncommon to see large mixed flocks of colonial nesting water birds. Once they start nesting, um, they kind of divide themselves out a little bit more, but it's not uncommon to see Franklin's gulls and white-faced ibis nesting together in a colony. In fact, this picture is from Malheur Lake in 2019 when, um, or 2020, when there was still enough water in the lake for one of the bays that has really great nesting habitat for these species in it. They um, they really, the colony was huge and it was really impressive and fun to watch that mixed um, mixing of species. So I'm gonna uh, a little bit more specifically talk about white-faced ibis and then even more more specifically talk about white-faced ibis later in the presentation. So um, one of the reasons white-faced ibis are a really great example of ecological dynamism is that they nest and forage exclusively in wetlands. They're highly nomadic, so they follow the water from year to year, their nesting strategy, like a lot of species are tied to territories, especially if they've been successful. So cranes are a great example. Sandhill cranes are tied to their nesting territories, but um, even if they had poor nest success, so maybe they hatched no eggs, or maybe they raised no chicks to adulthood, they'll still return to that territory to nest in uh, in the following year. White-faced ibis aren't like that. They, uh, even if they were really successful in one year, if the water's not there, they just move on to find another spot to nest. They require a combination of deep water areas and wet meadows. So that matrix of wetland habitats, which um, changes from year to year because the system is dynamic, uh, really like white-faced ibis kind of ex ecologically exemplify that need for a wetland matrix. And then their breeding cycle is really tied to hydroperiod. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, a few, in, in a few slides. But basically what that means is they make their decision when to breed based on water availability. And so in a species that demonstrates that, uh, a, that tie to when the water is here, that's a really great example of, of adapting to a dynamic system. So, our mid-altitude, we're coming down the Steens, we're overlooking the Blitzen River before it heads up into the refuge. And here's where we're going to talk a little bit about some important terminology, especially around um, drought and precipitation. So snowpack, the re so when people talk about snowpack, they typically mean snow water equivalent. And the reason they mean that is that snowpack itself can actually mostly be air depending on what the temperature is. So this graph here is a great demonstration of how much snow basically it requires, how many inches of snow 
are equivalent to one inch of rain at different temperatures. So when it's really cold, negative 21 to negative 40, it takes 100 inches of snow to, to equate to one inch of rain. And then on the other end of that, when it's warmer, 28 to 34 degrees, it takes approximately 10 inches of snow to equal one inch of rain. So depending on where you are, 100 inches of snow could mean quite a bit of water available in the spring, and it could mean not a lot of water available in the spring. And so that's why we talk about snow water equivalent, which is basically how much water is in the snow. And this provides a really great understanding of spring conditions. So when water allocations for irrigation are determined, um, they are based on the snow water equivalent on April 1st. So if you had really great snowfall early in the season, but you lose most of that, either to warm temperature, warmer than average temperatures or drier than average conditions, you'll actually, uh, your snow water equivalent will go down and less water will be allocated during the irrigation season. And one of the things that we know about snow water equivalent is it, that it's actually shifting earlier in the season. So the peak time uh, that water is available in the snowpack is shifting um, quite a bit in some areas. So in the in the Harney Basin, we have two snow tell sites, which are basically uh, remote sensors that measure soil moisture, snow depth. Um, snow water equivalent, um, amount of precipitation for the year. There's something else that I can't think of right now. Um, so we have two of them on the Ste on Steens Mountain and they kind of overlap in this picture. The, there's a small triangle that indicates that at lower elevations, the peak in snow water equivalent has actually shifted 15 to 10 days earlier and at high elevations on the Steens, which is this uh, slightly larger triangle right here, we've actually shifted by 20, 15 to 20 days um, earlier in the season. And this, this winter, of course, seems to be trying to make up for that. But in general, we're shifting about two to three weeks earlier. And um, you know, the last several years, we would normally get quite a bit of snow in February and it's, February has been dry the last several years out here. So the other important thing to talk about is what does it mean to be in a drought if you're in a system that's as dynamic as most of the Intermountain West is? At drought.gov, they define drought as a deficiency of precipitation over an extended period of time, usually a season or more, resulting in a water shortage. In a dynamic system, you might see multiple seasons where you receive less precipitation. And so the question, of course, for me is, well, does that count as an actual drought um, ecologically? And the answer for me is maybe, but probably not. So I think there are some better understandings or better definitions of drought that can aid in that understanding. The American Meteor Meteorological Society defines drought as a period of abnormally dry weather sufficiently long enough to cause a serious hydrological imbalance. So that includes shrinking of lakes, drying up of springs, things of that nature. And then NOAA goes a little bit further and says that drought um, creates a deficiency of moisture resulting in adverse impacts on people, animals, or vegetation over a sizable area. And so based on drought.gov's definition of drought, I would argue we're not really in a drought. We're within a nor, you know, we're within normal range of variability. But under NOAA's definition, we certainly are seeing some adverse impacts on people, animals, and vegetation over a, a pretty large area of the Intermountain West. Um, this is my uh, defense, I guess, for why I think that sometimes seasonal drying is normal for the Hardy Basin. This is standardized pre precipitation index. That's just, is it a wet year or a dry year and how wet or how dry? Dark blue indicates that it was a, a really wet year. Dark red indicates a really dry year. Uh, this little section here from about 1977-ish to about 1985 is the period of time when I think a lot of people who think fondly of Malheur remember Malheur 
from this time period. So Malheur Lake was very, very large. Harney Lake had a lot of water in it. And in part, that's because, as you can see from here, they were pretty wet years. There, was, there have been other chunks of time in the past that have been very, very dry years. Um, this period of time from the uh, mid-20s to mid-30s was one of the more recent times. I, this was the period of time where Malheur Lake actually dried up and people were farming in the, um, the lake bed. And then as you can see, we kind of vacillate back and forth quite a bit between really dry years, kind of dry years, really wet years, kind of wet years. Uh, it's really kind of all over the place. And that is kind of getting at that idea of ecological dynamism and the fact that the system is, is adapted for that change. So the last bit about drought is the drought extent. And the reason I decided this was important to talk about is that I recently had somebody ask me, um, I, I mentioned that we're still in a drought out here and they were shocked to hear that because of how much precipitation we've received this year. And so drought extent is basically the amount of dryness or dry conditions. And that's based on a bunch of things, including soil moisture level. So Oregon, and this is about two weeks old now, this graphic, um, it's actually the extent of drought in Oregon has gotten worse over the last two weeks. Um, despite all the precipitation we have. And in part, that's because February was just so dry compared to average. So this dark red is exceptional drought, and that's this area in um, Crook County. Most of the Harney Basin is actually still considered an extreme drought or worse. Uh, and, and at the very least severe drought, we have this one tiny, tiny sliver that's uh, considered to just be in moderate drought. Oh, I'm sorry, this was from about a month ago. This was just a week later after all of the snowstorms that we received across the state. You can actually see the drought was recorded as being worse after all the snowstorms that, you know, blanketed the coast and snow and everything. And in part, that's because snow doesn't provide as much moisture as rain. So when we would normally be receiving precipitation as rain, we received it as snow, which actually meant drier conditions on the landscape. Um, which is kind of a kind of a funny thing. And then the um, the government does this forecasting where they say, do you think the drought's going to get better or stay worse, or I mean, or get worse? Uh, for the next month, they're predicting that the drought will persist ac across most of Oregon. And actually, despite all the precipitation we've received this year, they're predicting that most of Oregon, the drought. Uh, is likely to remain, but will be less severe than it was um, to date. All right, so we're on the ground. You know, what does this look like in the Harney Basin and for birds in the flyway? <clears throat> so a little bit about the Harney Basin, mostly so that people, in case people haven't been out here before, they have a, a general understanding of, of how the Harney Basin functions. So Malheur Lake is our largely terminal lake that in a really big water year can overflow and connect to create one very large lake um, and feed into Mud Lake and Harney Lake. There are three different uh, rivers or creeks that drain into Malheur Lake. The Donner and Blitzen River, which comes from the south and travels north into the lake. The Sylvia's River, which comes from the north and travels south into the lake and Silver Creek, which actually travels um, from the Northwest and, and empties into the Harney Lake, mostly Harney Lake Playa right now. All of these systems are snowpack fed. So there aren't actually many ways for water to stay in this system if, it, if the precipitation comes as anything other than snow. So rainwater is gonna come down the rivers pretty fast and just empty into Malheur Lake and there's nowhere for that water to go except for into the atmosphere. So that's why it's called the Terminal Lake Basin. The caveat I always like to add to that is that this channel right here, um, where it's um, going out Highway 78 toward Gentura, Oregon, there's an area called the Malheur Gap. And at some point, a very long time ago, um, it actually says an undated shoreline on the map, 
Um, Malheur Lake was approximately 26 feet deep and connected to the Malheur River, to the Snake River, to the ocean. So at some point, um, you know, w within history, uh, Malheur Lake wasn't actually a terminal lake basin. So it's currently a terminal lake basin because of the climatic regime that we're under. Um, but at some point in the past, it we had salmon who traveled all the way up the river past the Malheur Gap, which is a pretty wild thing to think about. So overall, um, in the Harney Basin, we're seeing a long-term drying trend. This is 1995 to 2003. This map basically represents the average extent of water expressed on the landscape over that time period. April 2004 to 2014, you can see that um, less of this is considered permanent or semi-permanent wetland. That's what the blue is. And more of it is considered um, seasonal or temporary wetland. And then the current period that we're in is even more of a drying trend. And this is supported by data out of the Intermountain West Joint Venture. They have found that um, in part because of climate change and in part because of diversion for agriculture, wetlands throughout the Great Basin um, are shrinking over this time, the same time period. And so one of the species that I'm going to focus on is sandhill cranes. And greater sandhill cranes in particular, they nest at Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. During migration, we get large numbers of lesser sandhill cranes. They continue on up to the tundra and um, parts of Alaska and, and northern Canada to nest. When they are migrating through here, they depend on shallow lakes and rivers. So Malheur Lake is a great example. They often roost out on the lake and then fly from the lake into the flood irrigated wet meadows that are um, you know, adjacent to the lake in the Harney Basin. So that matrix of open water that can deter predators and grassy, um, like invertebrate rich, um, grassy uh, wet meadows and grasslands, they, they really depend during migration on that, that kind of matrix of, of lakes and wet meadows and grasslands. Typically they're out in the wet meadows probing for invertebrates. Sometimes they are also looking for bulbs. So they, they've been known to probe in the soil for camas uh, bulbs. And then they also eat a lot of seeds and grains and, and you know, basically whatever else they can find out in that soil. During the nesting season, they nest in wetlands that have standing water around them and forage in the adjacent wet meadows and grasslands. So this bird in particular was in the Sylvie's floodplain just south of Burns and when they first built their nest, which you can kind of see these dry, this dry vegetation around the bird is the extent of the nest. This nest was actually built out in a field that didn't have vegetation growing in it yet. And it was just, and she looked kind of like an island herself out in the middle of this big sea of, of water. And the reason for that is that coyotes, foxes, uh, skunks, raccoons, those predators that like to eat crane eggs are less likely to traverse that, that open water um, to get to the nest. And so they really seek out that, that the right amount of water in order to nest. And then, you know, as, as the vegetation grows up, they become more and more, <clears throat> excuse me, more and more sheltered. And so they kind of depend on that, that sheltering from the vegetation to also keep them hidden over time. Because sandhill cranes can be flexible with when they start nesting, and because the timing of, of snow melt is shifting and increased snowpack is shifting out here, one of the big concerns, uh, especially in wetlands that don't have infrastructure to manage when water is put on the landscape, is that 
if a crane, if there's water available and a crane initiates nesting and then a flood of water comes, it can actually not just flood the nest, but chill the eggs. So it, the water might not overtop the nest that the crane has built, but if the water gets close enough to touch the eggs, it can chill them and cause that nest to fail. So not only is water timing important, but the way that water is managed in these managed systems and the, the timing of that delivery becomes really, really important for maintaining um, any sort of long-term nest success for these birds. And, and, and because so much of the wetland habitat that's available in the Harney Basin is in these managed meadows on private lands, that relationship between cranes and um, private land managers becomes even more um, intertwined. And as I mentioned, timing is everything. So you want that water to arrive early enough to initiate nesting on time and you know, not so late that it ends up um, causing some sort of nest failure. For colt rearing, the cranes depend on that matrix of, of wet meadows and shallow wetlands and the standing water around their nests because they interestingly will often return to their nest to roost at night with their colts. And so they depend on that predator deterrent of the water through until the colts are big enough to um, you know, navigate some of that predator, those predator issues a little better. They require this kind of short, uh, what we call short stubble meadow, when the colts are smaller, like this one is. It's not, the, it's not particularly young, but it's not very big either. So when they're really small up until slightly bigger than this colt, they actually can't navigate the tall vegetation very easily. And so the uh, adult cranes will typically take them out to forage in this short stubble. So they, again, that mix of short stubble for foraging and taller vegetation for hiding when they're roosting or trying to avoid detection, like if a predator is nearby and the colt needs to lay down, like that matrix of different vegetation types and water types is really, really important for ensuring that cranes are successful. So what we know about drought and sandhill cranes, cranes are long lived. They can live in excess of 37 years. At Mal here, we also know that they naturally seem to have a low, uh, they have low nest success and low recruitment. So compared to other populations of nesting greater sandhill cranes, our cranes actually have um, what appears to be a natural, naturally low rate of eggs hatching and into chicks and chicks becoming adults. A lot of that is dependent on water timing. Um, we also have a lot of data that shows that drought is known to decrease recruitment. So drought is pretty strongly associated with failure of colts to become adult birds and be recruited into the adult population. And over time, cranes won't abandon a territory over one failed nest. They might abandon a territory over continued um, nest failure. And so over time, it can actually reduce the nesting population of cranes, uh, greater sandhill cranes in any given area. So our next species, uh, as I promised, I'm going to talk more about white-faced ibis. So white-faced ibis during migration really commonly forage in shallow wetlands. As, as these um, seasonal or temporary shallow uh, grassland, you know, meadow, wet meadow habitats are declining across the landscape, ibis have become increasingly dependent on uh, agricultural fields. And again, that's that short stubble. So it was mowed the previous year. The grass is still very short. It's now wet. So there's a lot of invertebrates. Um, they really, they eat a lot of worms <laughs> um, in the Harney Basin wet meadows. And they're also known for picking off uh, large insects like uh, dragonflies or grasshoppers off of those wetland and grassland plants. They will very, very rarely forage in a dry meadow for rodents, but I've not seen them do that. And I feel like it would be an interesting thing to see an ibis do. <laughs> um, 
during the breeding season. So they nest colonial, colonially in emergent vegetation and it's typically remnant vegetation from the previous year that then the new, like this season's vegetation will grow up through. So there's an ibis here. Here's its nest with its pretty eggs. There's another ibis here and one there, one more in the background and then a, a yellow at a blackbird. Um, so these colonies are typically surrounded by more open water, kind of like cranes. They depend on that open water to help keep predators from depredating their nests because they are really, really accessible um, if a predator is to get out to the colony. <clears throat> this is typically in semi-permanent marshes that are adjacent to seasonal marshes. So that means water that's going to persist through the breeding season that is adjacent to some of those seasonally flooded meadows and other wetlands that, you know, in a natural system, they would have been flooded by runoff from a river. And then their chicks, who I think are absolutely adorable, um, will actually remain at the nest for about three weeks before they start trying to fly. And so this uh, mat that they're that they're hanging out on is basically the remnants of their nest and the adults forage nearby and then just like other songbirds and um some of those you know uh birds that provide parental care they just regurgitate whatever they ate for the chicks and then at about five weeks they leave the nest and go out into uh other shallow wetlands so from the time nests are initiated to five weeks after hatching, ibis depend on these flooded wetlands surrounding their breeding habitat in order to be successful. So how is drought affecting white-faced ibis? Well, like I mentioned, they have a flexible breeding strategy, so they're able to move around from place to place as water is available. The problem with that is that that semi-permanent wetland that they depend on is it, uh, the loss of that semi-permanent habitat is increasing throughout the the west, um, to the Intermountain West, and so um, at Klamath in the uh, the Klamath Basin, Lower Klamath National Wildlife Refuge, for example, two years in a row, there was enough water for the ibis to initiate nesting and then the water dried up and so the colonies um, were abandoned and are likely to collapse. The birds are likely not to go back at some point if they don't get more water delivered long term at Lower Klamath. Um, and ultimately there's a risk of a large scale. So white-faced ibis are currently considered a species of low conservation concern, but because they tend to nest in these really large colonies and they don't nest it, well because they nest in large colonies and because the habitat that they need to nest in is declining across the west um, the risk of large-scale decline is higher because um, those colonies if they keep col if the colonies keep being unsuccessful in reproducing at some point that's going to create uh, more large-scale declines throughout their Intermountain West population. Okay, the next species I'm gonna talk about is uh, a type of shorebird. I'm keeping it a little bit high level for this slide just because I thought it was important to differentiate some things about shorebirds, shorebird migration and the Intermountain West. So um, we have one globally important stopover um, habitat or, or location and that's Lake Abert. So globally important means that birds that nest on other continents depend on that place uh, during stopover. So Aber is one of those places that birds that nest on other continents actually fly um, you know, over to Alaska, down through Canada, and stop over at Aber during migration to rest, recuperate, whatever they need to do. Mal here is considered a regionally important stopover habitat. So that's um, a place where birds throughout the Pacific Flyway stop over uh, during migration. And the reason that uh, Aber in particular, but um, not really Malheur, but Malheur National Wildlife Refuge through Harney Lake and some of the other playas out here, they're, the reason they're so important and valuable to shorebirds is they have this really high valuable food source in brine, fly, or brine shrimp, which 
I've been told I should actually be able to see if I was ever to scoop up water. I've always pictured them as being very tiny, like fairy shrimp, but apparently they're bigger than that. And I think that's pretty cool. And then brine flies, which nest in these really, really large numbers. Their larva is really, really high, uh, protein rich. And so in these areas, especially where there are brine shrimp and brine flies, shorebirds can gain a lot of the weight that they need in a short period of time to be able to continue their migration. And really specifically, this refers to Wilson's phalarope. So Wilson's phalarope, uh, this is a picture. All of the white dots are either the reflection of or are Wilson's phalarope in flight. This is at Mono Lake. Um, Wilson's phalarope migrate in these huge flocks. At Mono Lake, they will often count hundreds of thousands of Wilson's phalarope stopping over. They mostly stop over at salt lakes. And unlike most birds, Wilson's phalarope actually, and all phalarope species, molt during their migration. So they stop over at these lakes, they molt into, they molt new plumage, they double their body weight on brine flies and brine shrimp, and then they continue their migratory journey. And they do this both in the spring and the fall. So some important considerations associated with salt lakes and this ability to double their body weight is that as water levels decrease in places like Mono Lake and the Great Salt Lakes and Abert, um, not only are they losing acres of water and habitat, but it, there's increased salinity and not all bird species can handle, like there's a point at which the salinity in the water could potentially become too much, not only for the birds, but also for the brine shrimp and brine flies. So decreased water levels influences salinity, which then influences prey availability. Um, pretty specifically for migration, a little bit for post-breeding season. Wilson's phalarope, they're polyandrous. So the females will have up to six nests with six different males. They pick out a spot in the wet meadow, they make a scrap, a scrap, a scrape in the ground. They lay four eggs, which you can kind of see in the middle of this circle. And then the male tends to the nest. They actually um, pull the vegetation so that it partially hides the scrape. And they typically nest in loose colonies close to wetlands. So this picture of the nest is from a wet meadow. Um, it is not from a part of the wet meadow that was flooded. It's from a part of a wet meadow that is dry, but associated pretty closely with uh, an area that is flooded. And then when they're rearing their chicks, they will basically walk them down from the nesting area into the shallow marshes that are adjacent to them. So whether that is a flooded meadow, um, a mud flat associated with a pond, uh, et cetera, they take the chicks down to that area for foraging and the males and the chicks all hang out until until it gets closer to migration. And then the flocks of Wilson's Fowler Oak, um increase in size as the females all join them in staging to um, get ready to leave the area. And so drought and Wilson's Fowler Oak, what do we know about that? So we know that Wilson's Fowler Oak are intrinsically tied to these saline lakes and some of the larger lakes like Malheur. They're highly mobile from year to year. So a good example of that is that at Mono Lake, um, there were some shorebird surveys initiated, pretty specifically looking at phalarope. They found that in one year, there was an increase of about 35,000 Wilson's phalarope. And in that same year was one of the years that Lake Abert was at its driest before it dried up. And so the assumption is that those birds are probably birds that had gone to Lake Abert looking for habitat for stopover. And then because the habitat wasn't available, were able to move to Mono Lake. We saw um, last fall, we were, we were doing a shorebird survey out on Malheur Lake and we had, um, it was approximately 6,000 Rednecked phalarope and another seven ish thousand Wilson's phalarope, which is an abnormally high number of phalarope to be on Malheur Lake in August. And at that same time, Lake Abert was dry except for the springs on the playa. And so, what we think is that we saw an influx of phalarope at Malheur 
because it was just the closest place to go for food. Water rights aren't guaranteed at most of these stopover sites. Lake Abert doesn't have water rights associated with it. Um, Great Salt Lakes doesn't have water rights associated with it. Mono Lake does, Malheur Lake does. Um, and so because water rights aren't guaranteed to these bodies of water, um, particularly in years of drought, there isn't actually a guarantee that there will be water at most of the stopover sites. And that with climate change and extended drought, there's not even a guarantee that there's gonna be water at the lakes that have water rights. Um, it's pretty hard because fowler rope are so mobile, it, it's pretty hard to get an understanding of what their populations are, are actually doing. So there are some reports that say that fowler rope are increasing throughout the Intermountain West. We believe that their populations have potentially declined. There is more work being done around um, trying to monitor more bodies of water to see if it's possible that the fowler rope are just shifting where they typically stop over to new places where we maybe hadn't seen them before. And just like with the white-faced ibis, there is some inherent risk of, of being a species that, that travels in these really large flocks and that depend on these formerly permanent, but now more ephemeral bodies of water. And that large scale risk is that if something bad happens, it's going to be, you know, it's going to take a pretty large dent out of the population. So um, just because of their strategy alone, they're at some sort of risk associated with drought. So what does this all mean? Um, I don't actually want to be the one to inform you that we don't know yet. So um, from a bird population level, we don't have a large enough, as I mentioned with fowler rope, we don't have a good grasp on what fowler rope populations are at, like what their population size actually is. Um, for greater sandhill cranes, because they're so long lived, it's possible that, you know, 10 years of drought with a few years of um, low nest success, it's possible that that is something they can rebound from pretty easily. It's possible that the drought's going to continue and then that's going to mean something potentially different for them. So most of the most of what we all know as biologists is that all of the trends are not promising. So from a landscape level, the trend is wetlands drying up. That trend is largely associated with two things, water diversions for agriculture and uh, you know industry and climate change. And so there are some places like the Klamath Basin where we've seen some pretty stressful ecosystem collapsing um, happening with water delivery or water not being delivered to the refuges. And one of the things that I've heard, um, you know, People who have been doing, you know, who worked out at Malheur, for example, 30 years ago, I sometimes hear people say, well, if the water's not at Malheur, the water will be somewhere else. But the problem is, it's not necessarily true. If the water's not at Malheur, it's actually probably not going to be somewhere else, at least not yet. Once we you know, there's some pretty promising work happening around Lake Abert trying to ensure water getting back out to the lake. Um, but if the continued, if the, if the precipitation trends continue the way that they are, there may not be water to actually deliver to Lake Abert anyway. And so there's a lot of what ifs, there's a lot of concerning trends that we're seeing. And it's all possible that that white-faced ibis and Wilson's fowler rope and greater sandhill cranes have seen, you know, over their, as a species, over their species lifetime, which is very, very long, that they've seen these kinds of changes and rebounded from them just fine. So like within my lifetime, we might see some pretty serious declines that then rebound um, in future generations. And 
we might not we i yeah we just don't know yet um which feels like a really um big uh easy out for me <laughs> we don't know so what are some things you can do to get involved and what are some of the efforts that are going on in order to better understand some of the larger scale implications of drought the Intermountain West Shorebird Survey uh, is a survey that happened initially in from 1995 to 1998. And as the a couple of slides ago, that was actually a period when on average we had quite a bit of water on the landscape. And so Point Blue Bird Observatory in partnership with National Audubon, um, US Fish and Wildlife Service, Portland Audubon for the Oregon part of the count. Um, we're all working together to survey, basically resurvey all those surveys that happened in the 90s to get an understanding of what the condition of these wetlands is like. Part of that, part of these surveys is counting birds, part of these surveys is saying, is there even good habitat here still? Um, they're happening during migration in part, they're all coordinated. So they all happen within a very short window of time so that we're not double counting birds as they travel. Um, and the idea is that if in a 10 day period in spring and a 10 ish day period in fall, everybody along the Intermountain West does a shorebird survey, you're ha you have a pretty good estimate of what the population looks like. And then we can compare that data to the information from the 90s and see, you know, get at least the start of an understanding of what might be happening to wetlands and birds, shorebirds throughout the Intermountain West. And in Oregon, Primarily, these surveys are happening at Malheur um, and, and in surrounding Harney Basin uh, wetlands and at Lake Abert and that Summer Lake. Um, I manage the ones for the Harney Basin, so and I do all the volunteer recruiting. So if that's something, if you like to get out and hike, um, you can contact me and I will happily sign you up to um, come out and hike on the Harney Lake Playa or one of the associated habitats. We're also working, so the International Crane Foundation, um, I had a conversation with one of their biologists um, last summer, and there's some pretty big interest nationally in understanding what's happening to greater Sandhill crane populations in the Intermountain West as well. And so as kind of a way of, you know, understanding at least a chunk of that population, we are working to reestablish some crane recruitment surveys at Malheur and in the surrounding Harney Basin. One of the things that we have seen is that as water becomes less available later in the season and as more pivots, which are the big sprinkler irrigated circles on the landscape, as more of those pivots go in, we've seen cranes start using the pivots to forage largely on grain, sometimes on associated rodents. And so we really want to understand, like we've seen less colts and adults at on at Mount Here National Wildlife Refuge at the end of the breeding season, but maybe those birds are just shifting where they're foraging out to those um, different types of agricultural fields. And so from July 15th to September 15th, we're going to work on doing some recruitment surveys. So that's just understanding the ratio of colts to adults. And if we can get a, a protocol established, the hope is that we'll be able to work with the International Crane Foundation to expand those crane recruitment surveys and get a better understanding of what, what recruitment looks like throughout the Intermountain West. And then um, Project IBIS, which is not just about IBIS, um, there aren't any community science type projects that I know of focusing on IBIS right now, but uh, Project IBIS is a, an effort to inventory birds using the Sylvie's floodplain from March until the end of the breeding season. So that's capturing migration, for spring migration through to fall migration and associating that with water and some of the um, management of those fields. And that's the one project of these three that is kind of a do on your own time project. You just, with the protocol in hand, can come out and count what birds are using um, those flood irrigated wet meadows and, and the last couple of years, mostly dry meadows um, near burns north of the refuge. 
And there are some other ways that you can get involved. I picked these three because they mostly uh, associate with the birds I highlighted. And um, that is what I have for you. I'm happy to take questions now. I can stop screen sharing if that would be best. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, okay. thank you very much. We have a couple of Q and A's. I'm going to turn the lights on. So okay, we're, we're going to turn the lights on here so people can uh, see what's going on. Could you all hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. You could all hear. Well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very well. Here. And I'm sure the Zoom is good too. We got 26 uh, Zoom participants. Can you open the Q and A? Can yeah, there's just the one. No, there's two. Oh, is there? Yeah, yeah you can two. do it there. You, well, yeah, the same one. Oh. Uh, the fellow wanted to know if the phalarope migration is mostly birds nesting in the Great Basin or if they're molting and moving on. Do you know the percentages of those? It's a really good question. So, but the, so the interesting thing about that, and there are a lot of interesting things about phalarope, in my opinion. I really love them. Um, all of their molting or a pretty large percentage of their molting happens on mono lake or great salt lakes and so in any given year approximately 95 percent of all wilson's phalarope that are counted pass through um, mono lake so that's a pretty tight concentration you know of, of an area for birds to move through and so the birds that arrive at mal here or in the harney basin some of them do stop over and continue on north, but they have already molted. And then some of them do still nest here. So we, it's funny because um, I think it might be ODFW's website doesn't say that they nest in the Harney Basin, but um, they definitely nest in the Harney Basin. And so what percentage of them, I don't know what that is. Okay, uh, any questions here in this audience? Yes. Do we know anything about the Columbia River Basin fish that might have gotten into Harney Lake back when it was uh, still water was still flowing down through the Highway 78 gap? Um, I guess for clarification, do you mean, do we know if there are still fish in the lake? The question I'd really like to have answered is, do we know anything about which fish used to uh, may have entered the basin? But part of that answer is, are any of those species still extant? In the are there any uh, Columbia River Basin fish species still existing in the Malheur Basin, either if it's just the Blitzen River? I know they're not in the Silvage River because it goes dry. Yeah. Uh, or uh, do we have any sort of historic or prehistorical evidence from fossils or anything about what might have been there? So we do have evidence. Um, one of the reasons we know that the lake once went through the Malheur Gap into the river is that archaeologists at a site near Juntura, when the river, then the lake would have had to have been about 26 feet deep, actually they found salmon bones in a midden, so in one of the like waste areas uh, at this archaeological site. So we know that salmon made it that far into the lake because of the archaeological evidence. Red band trout, I don't know that they're a Columbia Basin variety, but we do have red band here. We have a bunch of native, um, very small fish like red sided shiner and uh, um, tui chub and and some fish populations associated with springs that are we they that people believe got to those springs from when the lake was gigantic and as the lake dried up they basically the habitat that was left was these springs that are now um pretty far away from any other bodies of water there's actually a crawdad species that is the same it's a crawdad species that is mostly found in the snake river area but there's a spring at Mal here that has a population of them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. 
Uh, a couple of things. I, I'd like to follow up first on what Ray was asking about on the, the Malheur Gap when, and when there was that connection with the Columbia Basin. Uh, how, how recent was that, that the, last, the last time there was a connection? The, so we know that it was recent enough that the ancestors of the Burns Paiute were living at the shores of the giant lake. Um, but I don't everything I've read just as an undetermined date. So there's a range that can go that goes back. I mean, we know that the Paiute have been here for about 15,000 years. So sometime within the last 15,000 years. Um, yeah, that helps a yeah. lot. So when people were here, pretty recent. Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. And then um, I'm also wondering about uh, another big lake in the the Great Basin area, the Great Salt Lake. I, you know, read recently about how people are projecting that that's going to dry up completely within a few years. And do you know, uh, are, are there efforts to perhaps purchase water rights for that, or is any kind of thing going on to address that? I think so. The um, Congress passed some. Um, not actually. Well, uh, Congress passed a bill that dictated the USGS to do a study on um, terminal lakes in the Intermountain West. So, and they divided that between basically Oregon, um, Utah, what's the other division? I don't remember right now, Nevada maybe. Um, and so they're tasked with identifying important lakes that are being negatively affected by not having water rights, basically. So I, I, I am fairly certain that Great Salt Lake will be one of the lakes that's being talked about. Outside of that, I don't actually know if there's any concerted effort to um, acquire water rights for the lake. I know that in Argentina, there's a salt lake, which is where the Wilson Sphalerope um, typically winter that was just recently given water rights. So at least on their wintering grounds, they're being protected. And here on their breeding grounds, they're being protected. But, you know, in between a lot of places that aren't. And I I know there's more interest in protecting the, the those areas, but I think it's going to be, um, it's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of collaboration. Yeah, it will. Think of Utah politics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. I wonder if with global warming, some of these birds will stay places, you know, survive because they'll stay in their northern homes. Like, like turkey vultures. <laughs> turkey think... vultures are hanging out in Eugene now pretty regularly. And I think well, I think that. it really depends on the birds. What yeah. do you think? Well, not, I think, you know, uh, as somebody who tries not to get stuck in the <clears throat> down the the negative, um, I want to be optimistic. I want to believe that um, these birds that have have been on the landscape for a very long time and through lots of different climatic climactic situations will adapt. I think we're seeing wetland drying happening so fast that it is hard to believe that a lot of these species can adapt fast enough. Um, but I think I remain hopeful that because so many of them ecologically are nomadic, that even if they leave Oregon, um, that maybe they will find somewhere else that they, they can persist. Okay, thank you. So you mentioned that uh, the source of the loss of wetlands in the West uh, Intermountain area was due in part by global change and partly by industrial and agricultural um, irrigation. Do you, do you have breakdowns on, on those percentages? Um. Oh man, off the top of my head, I don't remember what they are. Um, they're the paper, and I could send it to you if you um, actually want to read it, but um, it's, so the funny thing, not haha -ha funny, the interesting thing about 
this the situation with agriculture being associated with wetland drying is that agriculture is also becoming a source for temporary wetlands and so and seasonal wetlands so as semi-permanent wetlands become drier on the landscape it actually looks like we're losing less wetland than we are because the agricultural wetlands or the agriculturally created wetlands um look like you know, from a satellite, for example, like a wetland, they just don't persist as long as the semi-permanent wetlands. And so, um, you know, it's kind of like parsing out how much of that semi-permanent loss is associated with agriculture and not, I don't remember the percentage on my head. I do remember that they talk about it in the paper. Yeah, it's, I, I, I suspect it, there's no way to really know, but I wonder if there's any studies being done. I remember two years ago, I think it was in May of 21, drove Greenhouse Lane. Um, and there were two cranes, one on either side of the highway with nests uh, that they were sitting on in agricultural wetland. When I came back in June, both nests had been abandoned. How common is that? Because we're misleading the cranes by making them think it's a marsh and it's not. It's just an irrigated field that's going to get drained. Yeah. And that's that's actually one of the, when I first moved out to the Harney Basin, there was a lot of talk about migratory birds and not a lot of talk about breeding birds. And so one of the biggest issues that I see in the Great Basin and the Intermountain West is that for so long, we focused on making sure there was enough good migratory habitat for um, dabbling ducks, for example, that, and we, we didn't stop to think about the breeding habitat that we were ignoring or about the breeding habitat we were artificially creating. Those agricultural fields, like you mentioned, Harry, they yep. look like good nesting habitat. And if you are a bird looking for good nesting habitat, you're gonna nest in them and they're gonna be dried by June and they're gonna be mowed. And yeah, what? Um, how many birds are we tricking into thinking they've found a good spot yeah, it's going to be cranes and curlews and yep. all sorts of other things. Yeah. Yeah. I have another question. It's a little bit off topic, but National Audubon has a climate change a climate change program. Uh, are you familiar with that program? And and is it collecting data unique from all the other data that's being collected, like from birds from eBird? And from the breeding bird survey and from the surveys you're doing? So I'm familiar with the climate, um, their, their climate community science, their, oh, okay. I don't know what it's called, but their climate program. I, the, I don't, so they have specific species that they're looking at and that has become like my main reason for not becoming involved with it out here because I think it's an important project is is mostly because they are really focused on it's a suite of maybe 10 species if I remember correctly um and most of them are species that don't nest out here and so I I've looked into it but I haven't really gone beyond that I don't know that anybody be a great grad student project <laughs> to start pulling in the breeding bird survey data and the climate project data and all these community science projects into one um, kind of related data set though. Right. Uh, I wanna just mention the people that are watching on Zoom, you can communicate with us verbally or by uh, chat. You yeah, can certainly I... type something in the chat if, if anybody has any questions. I can invite them to unmute themselves. We will, we will also invite you to unmute yourself if you have any more questions. Anybody else got a question? Yes, one more question for Teresa here. Uh, it's, um, you mentioned that the lifespan for the 37 dog, the reproductive lifespan is. So, how long can they last out these droughts? So, they probably can't reproduce at 37. Maybe they can reproduce at 20 or 25. So, that would be interesting to know. Um, I thought up the sound. If we're not getting any. Can these existing adults, what's their reproductive lifespan? Did you hear the question? How I'm long not... can cranes reproduce? Or can they do what the albatross does on midway and keep breeding in the 60s? Um, that is an amazing question. 
and I don't actually have an answer for you. I know that they don't receive, they don't reach sexual maturity until they're at least a couple years old. Um, so conceptually, if they can live to 37 years, they're only reproductive for, you know, 25 ish of those. I, so I suspect that with a lot of, so with a lot of larger birds, they will still remain reproductive. They just will potentially lay less eggs. They'll potentially um, be less successful as they age. But don't yeah, I don't know that we have an exact number of those years. I talked to Gary Ivey, who's, who studied Greater Santo Cranes at Mount here about this once. And he was like, you know, nest success is a weird thing because cranes live so long that if they have two colts by the time they're 20, then it doesn't really matter if they're successful anymore after that from the perspective of just replacing themselves. If you want the population to grow, clearly then you want them to be more successful than that. But um, that, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a number of years for you. Kathy? Hi, I, I'm trying this. I, I've never done this from home. I've always been at meeting, but. I am hurt my back gardening and I've got a heating pad on. <laughs> anyway, um, but here's my question. Um, when uh, is the spring um, migration count at Mel here? What, what are the actual dates this year? So we are um, counting on the 27th and 28th and we're asking people to come out on the 20 spend the 26th to the 29th here basically and i that april yeah, yeah. oh april no yeah, sorry. Okay. april yeah because yeah. i will be there darn i will be there um may 27th to june 1st and i would love you know we have I'm another already... count we have another count that falls over that weekend you can be involved in uh we're attempting a marsh bird bio blitz um that memorial uh, day weekend how, how would how would you do that I mean, how, we're, yeah, I mean, by boat? <laughs> no, uh, the marsh bird bio blitz is actually because so many of the marshes at Malheur and in the Herney Basin are adjacent to roads. Um, we just drive them the route. Uh, okay, I'm going to sign up. I'd love to. <laughs> There's a sign up available on Portland Audubon's website in our community okay. site page. Thank you. Yeah, I love it. it. Thank you very much, Teresa. And I hope it snows like crazy for the next two weeks. It definitely is snowing a lot right now. <laughs> okay, good. I hope it keeps coming. And your roof doesn't collapse. Thank you very much. Thank you. I loved it.